All right, we're back. It's Art for All People. It's Lisa. And Daylon. We are here with Mar Dr. Marcia Leventhal. Um, she is, you want to tell us about yourself? From which point of view? Um, I, <laughs> that's a good question. From your point of view. My point of view. <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, I just, do you want me to look at you or the camera? Yes. Uh, the camera's good. The camera. Mm -hmm. So I am a professor, teacher, uh, innovator in the field of dance movement therapy, dance is a human art. I've been a performer since I was about four years old. Um, professionally through my teens and so forth. Um, so I was always a dancer, actor, and got more into the healing uh, when I was working on a master's degree at UCLA. Um, for many years I have seen the value and the importance of helping people understand the power of this moving body, coping with forced homes basically. And that's been my mission. I actually left a um, tenured position at NYU to start to bring the message mm -hmm. to the world. And I've accomplished that somewhat. I started programs in Australia, Japan, Great Britain, Sweden, um, Argentina. Now I've just started a program in Turkey and China and continue to work in Greece. And it feels like um, slowly the word is spreading, but it's also the ripple effect. There's something very powerful about this medium, and yet people are very frightened of it because it brings them too close to their body and therefore their feelings. And it's too much honesty that has to happen too fast. And um, at the same time, this is the most one of the most ancient um, forms of healing. And yet it's and, and, and by the way, there was put a codice on there. It's this, the reason people use dance as healing thousands of years ago are the same reasons people go to psychotherapy today. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah. so I'm going to, it's hard for me to look there when I really. Yeah, think. whatever's comfortable it's, for you, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, you know, you think about it, um, people are anxious, they're depressed, they don't understand what's going on in the world, they have conflict at levels they don't even understand themselves. And in a way, the ancient dances were what allowed us to contain that. And ancient um, civilizations understood that in some level, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. So it's, I had the privilege of working, uh, not working, having done to be some ancient dances in a small village in uh, Brazil called Apajanya. Mm -hmm. It's where John of God, the great healer, mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. And this is a tribe that came up from the Amazon because their land had been taken away from them. And six couples, young couples, came up to just give their handicrafts and their dances to try and make some money to send back to their starving people. And they danced with me and for me, and it felt like I was back thousands of years. Mm. The dances were so authentic and so powerful. Mm. And they all felt like shamans when they were dancing. Mm. So it felt like an amazing privilege. Yeah. But it's, um, there should be no but, it should be and. Uh, it's been a challenge and a great privilege to be able to do this around the world. I find that around the world is more open than our own country. We're very closed on a lot of levels and for a lot of reasons. And I am so enriched when I come back from having people get it. <laughs> uh, I just got back from Istanbul and it was just thrilling. And a few months before that I was in China and I thought China would be so scary. I'd been there did something like 15 years ago and it was, I wasn't thrilled about what happened. Just the kind of reception this time, it was night and day. Uh, people were excited, thrilled, um, very... Um, open? On me? some levels they were open, you very think, open. than before? Very open. That was what was so amazing. But not only open, they were willing to go beyond anything that they would even think they would know. And you have to understand that only one or two generations away from the Cultural Revolution, where everything was cut down, destroyed. So it was quite an extraordinary experience. And to watch in one week, I worked eight hours a day for one week, people the first day with this tightness mm -hmm. and this fear, and the end, they were rolling and jumping and throwing themselves. And I'm not talking about young kids. Probably the, it went up to 70, I would say. So it was quite extraordinary. What a breakthrough. Yeah, it was amazing. I want to dance. <laughs> Let's do one here. <laughs> wow.
it's pretty cool so after all this creative like create what feeling can you tell us in one word what does art mean to you I can't tell you in one word because all art isn't the same. So visual art is different than the moving arts um, or the sound arts. You could say the big umbrella is art and what does art do? So in a general way, art has the potential to transform. Potential. <laughs> there you go. Super. Let's go back to talking about art, meaning dance as a modality of healing and transformation. How and why does that happen? Okay, we're not talking about all dance. No. So we're not talking about necessarily folk dance or uh -huh. uh, ballet or any particular other form of uh, Arthur Reigns. That's a very particular form of dance and although it's kind of very therapeutic and it feels great and your body looks wonderful afterwards, it's not necessarily causing any transformative change on that soul level. Mm -hmm. So we have to talk about what I consider conscious healing dance or Perfect. basic dance. Yes. So I call it the conscious healing dance. Over the years, I've changed it, but conscious healing dance is now what I call the quantum healing dance. Quantum? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I feel we live in two worlds simultaneously that we're constantly juggling, without knowing it, two paradigms. One is the very traditional, I could say mundane, without meaning it in a pejorative way, but the things we have to do like from the Newtonian world, nine to five. You know, We have obligations, we have things to take care of, we have to make a living. How do we ever free ourselves of those obligations to be in that creative space, to go to that timeless space, and that's the quantum world. And that's where I found people go when they start to move with the conscious healing dance. Mm -hmm. So it took me years to be able to come up with this very simple explanation between the quantum and the Newtonian, but now it allows me then to teach it and bring it to the world in a way that I couldn't before, because I didn't understand it. So there's things we have to learn. We can't, you know, start to do all this creative, a spontaneous movement unless we know this is our head, these are our hands, this is our shoulders, mm -hmm. and unless we have a little bit of ability to be a little bit flexible. And, and, and by the way, people can be in a wheelchair, they can be in a chair and just move whatever they can move. There's still going to be something that's going to go inside. I do something with people where I have them take it, we do an energy drawing and then we take it inside and we imagine that we're waking up all ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because I know that imagination is energy, energy is power, and the power is actually waking up the cells because we know we can change, heal on a cellular level. That's fantastic. And that's what um, dance therapists have known forever. There's a lot of talk now about mirror neurons and all this psychoimmune neurology. Huh. But that's, dance therapists have known that intuitively for a long time. We go in and we begin to connect with human beings on an energy level. We attune with them. We begin to feel where they're stuck and begin to try and lead them out to the more light. Mm. And that stuff. Mm. Wonderful. Did I answer your question? Because I can. You, you did. Know. I mean, I did. It, it makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all about like it, the practice. Like when you're in that space, when you're experiencing it, especially when you're it's through your own body. Yeah. You're experiencing it, and the thing that the dance therapist does is holds the space in a particular way. We learn from the new physics that any time an object is observed, it changes. Whatever happens, the observation in a sense. So that's helped us a lot because when I teach people and myself understanding it, energy is real. We yes. don't necessarily see it. You as artists understand it because you're working energetically. Mm -hmm. We have to energetically hold the space and what we hold is where the person's at now and where they need to go next. Mm. And not judging where they're at now, but knowing that if where they were at now was so wonderful, they wouldn't be stuck. They wouldn't be in their depression, their anxiety, their schizophrenia, their psychosis. Yeah. So the idea is that we have to understand development. That's, that's the Newtonian. We have to understand development. We have to understand psychodynamic processes. We have to understand a lot because we're holding that energy, energetically. So I can work with you and never move with you, but I'm moving because I'm energetically with you as you're moving and seeing what's next. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. It it's pretty beautiful. So when when does a breakthrough happen? It could happen anytime. Anytime. There's no there's no recipe. <laughs> what's interesting for me and how I got to this place early on in my career, I was already a professor at NYU and really scrambling because there was no field and having to create theory and develop mm. courses and so forth. And I started to be asked to do workshops at different conferences and I was terrified and scared to death and 
I remember after presenting at one conference, some people came up to me, and this was the first time I'd heard this, subsequently I've heard this many times, they said, I've been in therapy for five years or ten years or whatever, uh -huh. and I've never had such insight as I have today. Mm -hmm. Now, I wasn't leading something to bring people to insight. Yeah. I was just doing what I knew about some kind of movement in groups and getting people more spontaneous and in a very general way. Mm -hmm. you know. And that and, and enough of that that happened enough times yeah. that I started to try to educate myself for that, understand it, mm -hmm. hold for it, mm -hmm. um, and begin to develop theory and processes around it. Mm -hmm. so, Wonderful. So breakthroughs can happen in a moment. Yeah. You know, um, just trying to think to give you some examples. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you, yeah, I just gave this example actually this time. Really. I was talking about a little bit of movement can go a long way. I had a client who was coming for verbal psychotherapy. She knew I was a dance therapist, didn't want to move, didn't matter what I said, no matter how I would coax her. She sat on the couch every week in the same position, and we were dealing with a particular theme around her mother and her connection to her mother and the needing to have her mother let go and she needed to get all of her life and the struggle, the conflict, it was on and on and on. This particular day she came in and she said, she started talking, she said, my shoulder's really hurting today. And I said, as gently as I could, I said, well, maybe you could just shift your position slightly. And she goes like, so let's say she's sitting like this and she goes, Oh my God, <laughs> I'm holding on to my mother. She's not holding on to me. Whoa, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a little movement can go a long way. <laughs> yes. Wow, that's so that's cool. That's quite a testimony. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. And so you can imagine if someone is willing to move. Yes. You know, now you can't go very fast. I mean, we do, but we ought not to because as I said, a little bit of movement goes a long way. So you start to there and dancing. Like people go to um, slam dances and you know, mm -hmm. these group dances and they have a wonderful time and it's thrilling, but you know, it can be very dangerous. Yeah. Be very dangerous. Because too much gets uncovered too fast and what do you do with it then? How do you kind of give it some kind of form, some kind of structure, mm -hmm. take it somewhere so that it can help you? Yeah. So it's your, it's a sacred vessel that you're creating. Thank you. The space. Yeah. I, I for many years called the space of work in Temenos, and I still feel that way. Mm. I mean, I you know I have a little altar, and I, I say just space before we work, and I ask people to try and honor it when they come in, and not be you know gossiping and all kinds of things before we start to work. And do it out in the hall or out where mm. we're taking notes or something. I try and keep it as sacred as possible. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think Beautiful. it's important. Beautiful. Well, we're here at the Bridge to the Soul, the Art of Healing exhibition. Uh, and you had a, uh, just a little chance to look at it before. Uh, uh, and can you talk about a little about the uh, Art of Healing? And what you're feeling. transformation and what you're getting when you're in what this What I'm feeling space? is all the ones that I'm attracted to are way out of my price range. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Um, I don't know what the genesis was for the artist who presented, where the artist, was it, um, how did you find the artist? Yeah, we did a call for artists and it was all about artists venturing into the realms of alchemy or healing and it could be interpersonal or it could be societal. It was, for example, Daniel Levin, uh, Daniel Langton, he has Crohn's disease, disease. so his whole, um, his transformation was via um, you know, like kind of putting that on the, the paper, getting it out of himself. Behind you is Rona, who um, all, does all about art and yoga. Her is this fusion, how this practice of being in her body actually stimulates her creativity. Um, Rico does, um, this is an eco prayer flag. So basically he's um, asking the community to say a prayer and healing for humanity. So yeah. each one, so I mean, each, it's so amazing, this exhibition, each, we could tell you, like, for an hour, like, mm -hmm. each person has a beautiful, eloquent story of how... We actually, as each artist... Why is our healing? And yeah. that's part of the dialogue. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah. So then the next step would be, and are you making an assumption, or are you just wanting to see what happens to reactions, because is the assumption if they go to that deep place and think about whatever it is that they're trying to heal or change or transform, 
someone observing it is going to feel the same way. We are in a subtle way. This is a this is a um, a gallery in a workplace, yeah. and it's in a science a, a laboratory. Yeah. So we're dealing with um, folks who have different perceptions and different worldviews. Mm -hmm. So we're it's a subtle thing. We want the the shift. I mean, we have information about each artist, but we want the person to come in front of the painting and go, whoa, <laughs> you know what I mean? Feel it. And then, then if they're interested, dive into it. Go like, I'll read the catalog, I'll read about yeah. the artist. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Yeah. Well, I, I think actually, individually, each of us that comes through is going to be attracted to different pieces. Which ones are you attracted to? Let's, let's move. Well, I, there's something in each one that yeah. I can stop and say, gee, yeah. wow. But there's something I'm very attracted to. Oh. Her name is Yeah. Actually, these three, actually these four. <laughs> they kind of feel like my being. Mm. That's something I really to. I connect to the energy, the colors. Um, I can get deeply inside. This one takes me further. So does this one. Um, this is really almost similar to my work. It's pretty much a spiral. And I talk about the unfolding process. And from the Oliver Wendell Holmes had a poem called uh, Build Me More Stately Mansions, O My Soul. And we take the Nautilus shell, we take the little ant and it gets constantly it's building a bigger and bigger and bigger chamber until finally it flows out into the sea, and it's going to the sea. So I'm always thinking of the spiral, and I actually have people move the spiral, because mm. all of our joints and muscles and bones, there's a spiral in there. So we start to move, and we start to connect on a very deep level to a home in our being. So that feels like a spiral. So does this one, actually. Uh, the Phoenix Rising by Lee McCluskey. And that's my painting. <laughs> that's your <laughs> That's actually the healing art of dreams. Well, that's one I, from one of my dreams, yeah. Interesting. Well, I've looked out very much like mine. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, I was very happy with this one. Mm. <laughs> and I know that's yours. Is that a Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. He, oh. uh, Brian Leonard, he's from Texas, Austin, and those are light beans. And he has this amazing ritual that he actually, they're in cards, and he'll go up to strangers and give you a card. And it's just really quite an amazing. Yeah, it, it, see, it looks to me like Buddha, it looks like Shiva. It yeah. Looks like, you know, it feels like some of the ancient traditions that I've studied. And yeah. Stuff, and it just. It please, has, please pick one, it will be yours. <laughs> it's it, the artist's gift. Okay, you have to, when you pick yours, it has to be with intention. Okay. So my intention is what would I need. Beautiful. It's Love. yours to keep. It's yours. That's amazing. And this exhibition, the, the whole project is all about the heart. And you know. Well, uh, we, we coined it kind of like the global renaissance of the heart. And I think that's what you're doing with dance. And I mean, you've done it for a, a, a while. Yeah, well, <laughs> talking to you about this peace project, this happened because um, quite a few years ago I was working on an island of Skiros with a very disparate group of people. There was like one of the heads of one of the banks of England in it, there was a first um, radical lesbian to come out in Galway, Ireland. Mm. There was a man that introduced himself as a male chauvinistic pig, smoking and drinking in the first day, who was a physician was a very timid social worker from way up north in Scotland. It was just a very disparate group. And there was a young woman there from um, Esalen. So it was like from way conscious to no consciousness. Wow. Of and one of the things we did is we moved and then people had to present some aspect of something going on in their life, create a ritual around it. Everyone had to participate mm -hmm. in the ritual. So everybody was in everybody's dance for that. Mm -hmm. At the end of, the, I think it was two weeks. I can't remember if it was two weeks or one week. The guy from the Bank of England said, have you ever thought of taking this to the United Nations? <laughs> oh. Wow. And I said, what do you mean? He says, this is a plan for peace. The reason he said that is at the end of the whatever it was, one or two weeks, people loved each other. Oh, yeah. There was all this, all it was 
and it didn't matter that you came from Yahweh and you were a radical lesbian and you were the male chauvinistic pig, it was like there was love. Wow. And it was amazing. Mm. And I thought, you know, the first day I thought, they're going to kill me or kill each other. <laughs> Whichever comes first, I hope it's me because I have to watch the rest of this massacre. So it's so amazing. Your workshops are basically testimonies of, of the experience itself. You just, they're treasures. It's pretty fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. It's amazing. Important your work you're doing. Thank you. Very important. I just want to, I, I noticed what I really love about your talk, you talk about science. And I think, let's talk about this because we're in a science building. Yeah. What's the marriage of dance, art, and science? Well, and I, where is it going? I think the very important thing with the science, and this is just very broad because I'm not prepared with, you know, I, exactly. I take science stuff in and then I just innovate it and I let it go. But I have all the notes on my knees. But the thing that I really am very clear about is the rishis, so the ancient sages, said much of what modern science is talking about today. And that's what's so profound. So I think there's a deep level in which scientists go that they don't have to be in their Newtonian world, but they have to be extremely open to new ideas. Probably They're tapping the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, exactly. I think we're tapping the same thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Well said. Any more questions or final thoughts, Jilan? Well, it's like, it's amazing how everyone we interview is coming up with uh, the scientists meet artists and that on that deep level, like when you go deep enough, it's the same source. We're all tapping. Actually, into. I'll tell you another real quick story. I was doing a workshop. This is in Leeds, in England, very many years ago. And right before I left New York to go to England, there had been an article in the New York Times about the new theory in physics. Was it string? Was it wave? Was it mm -hmm. dot dot dot? Mm -hmm. So I thought, God, that's interesting because we're dealing with energy. So I get to Leeds and I, after we've done about a day's work, I said, I have an idea. Would you like to try just something energetic? And so I brought this to them, wave, string, whatever. Mm -hmm. And probably within 10 minutes, the group, and I would say there were probably 20 to 30 people there, were in the most profound movement. And everybody, it wasn't just one or two, it was everybody, but in a place I'd never seen before. Wow. And later when they talked about it, they felt they'd gone to a primordial place. So it, we talked about it the rest of the day, and then that night, um, the person who invited me over and another woman and I went out to dinner at a place there's a little cafe that people go between Leeds and Bradford called the Corner Cafe. And you all sit at the same table. So we're, three of us okay. are sitting at a table, and there's two men sitting next to us. And they're listening to us talk about this. And so one man leans over and says, excuse me, can't help over here. Are you women physicists? <laughs> and I said, no, we're not. We're dance therapists. And he said, well, I'm, uh, he was a professor of physics, and his friend was the editor of the local paper. And they heard us talking, and I said, well, this is what we went from a physical piece into the steep, and we started to talk. It was an amazing dialogue, and I'm sure there's no accidents. Wow. They were supposed to be there, we were supposed to be there. Wow. Beautiful. So there's been enough of those that have happened that, you know, that's the fuel that keeps one going, because it's not always easy. You know, <laughs> we, we know. <laughs> when you're following your heart and your dreams and yeah. trying to change the world. Yeah, well, for yeah. the better. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts? No, I think what you're doing is extraordinary. I think the fact that you're being recognized and you're, this is really beautiful. And um, yeah, no. Thank uh, you. Thank you so Thanks much. for being part of our Arts and Healing interview series. And um, thank you for asking me. All right. I feel very honored. Thank you, Marcy.